I invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Just grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 965 and you will find our text in Matthew chapter 7. As always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, you want to read God's Word, but you actually don't own one, uh, then please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, let me just tell you about something that's coming up that uh, I'm excited about. I want you to be excited about. I want you to be praying about. Uh, if you're so inclined, but we have two mission teams that are leaving this week to, uh, to serve God in other places. See, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth, and we do that in Lake Havasu and Parker and to the ends of the earth. And so uh, we've got two teams heading out towards the ends of the earth. We've got a team of eight that is going to do medical evangelism in Thailand, uh, so they're going to be yeah, they're going to be serving there, and so pray for them, travel mercies, uh, and that uh, God just uses them in an incredible way. Thailand is a country with less than 1% of the population believers. And then uh, we've got a team of high school students and adults that are going to the big island in Hawaii. Uh, uh, they're leaving this week as well, and some of you are like, I want to go on that one. Yeah, they're going to be working with a church plant, doing evangelism through Vacation Bible School and work projects. Uh, they're sleeping on the floor of a church, so if you want to go, you, that, that's not as, as cool as you think it is. It's still Hawaii, but, you know, it's not, uh, it's not resort Hawaii. So anyway, be praying for them, and, uh, you know, we've got other trips coming up, and if that's something you're interested in doing, let us know. Uh, we would love to take you with us on one of our trips uh, to the ends of the earth or just to the place next uh, door. In fact, this week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, they were finished early Wednesday morning. Uh, we painted the, the uh, down in Parker, the, uh, one of the buildings where they do Head Start and painted all the rooms inside, got finished early, got finished in, because we have great volunteers who went and served, uh, and again, are representing Jesus, uh, beginning right here at home and to the ends of the earth. So I praise God for a church that serves. Yeah. It is awesome. Hey, uh, today we're continuing our discussion of prayer. And uh, we are jumping ahead a couple of passages. Uh, if you've been following really closely, you're like, we're not in Matthew 7, we're in Matthew 6. What are you doing skipping around? But uh, we want to wrap up this conversation of prayer. And Jesus kind of talks about uh, prayer in Matthew 7. We want to tie that with the model prayer. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the principles of prayer. Uh, talked about how prayer is to be private. It's about you and God face to face in that conversation. It doesn't do any good to repeat things over and over and over again. And it's not some magical words that you utter. And it's not to be done so that other people think you're holy and spiritual. Last week, Pastor Joe talked about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus gave a, a kind of an example prayer. And then Joe gave us an example of what uh, your prayer time could look like if you're having a quiet time praying through Scripture. And if you didn't see that, I encourage you to go online and check it out at calvarylhc.com. Uh, and then this evening and this weekend, we're finishing up our discussion on prayer. And, and we hope that our prayer challenges and conversations and examples have impacted your life and will continue to do so. Uh, because if you're a follower of Jesus, we want you to pray and we want you to understand what Jesus taught about prayer. So, if you had one wish, let's just say you're cleaning out your garage, finally, or your closets, finally, right? And you happen to come across a box, you don't know what's in, you open it up, and it's got some kind of Tupperware that hasn't been opened in forever. Because I know none of you have a lamp with oil in it, okay? So, and you pop that Tupperware and a genie pops out, it's, you know, 2019, he says, you don't get three wishes, we're on the economic plan, you get one. You got one wish. Can't wish for more wishes. What's your one wish for? It's got to pertain to you, not like world peace or something like that. So uh, it's got to pertain to you. So what's that one wish that you would make? Uh, got it? Tell your neighbor. What's the one wish? What would you wish for? See, some of you are, uh, are like, I don't know. Then you've got, so you've got dinner conversation or lunch conversation with your friends. What's the one wish? You see, there's tension in our culture between people who uh, 
hesitate to ask for anything at all. You know who you are. You're the people who are like, everybody goes, hey, let me know if I can help. And even if you need help, you're not going to ask. You're hesitant to ask for anything. And then on the other side, there's, you know, people who feel entitled to never stop asking. And uh, see, this impacts our understanding of prayer. So uh, I want to specifically address those who are followers of Jesus. So if you're here and you believe that Jesus actually is the Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment personally to follow Jesus, then what Jesus says specifically pertains to you. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you want to listen in on his wisdom. You want to listen into what he's saying, uh, because if you become a follower, we want you to understand prayer. But uh, uh, his words are truth, and they're going to bless anybody who is listening. So... Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11 is what we're looking at. Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Uh, I want you to know first and foremost that God invites us to ask. God invites us to ask. I mean, that's what Jesus is telling us. Hey, ask and it will be given to you. Uh, You know, God will give to those that, uh, his children, if you will, that that he wants to bless, he wants to to give good things to, if they ask him. And that means for some of us in this room, you need to get over your pride and make some requests of God. You've grown up in the super holy uh, school of thought that says, I can never ask for myself because then I'm just being selfish. And so you only pray for other people. You only pray for God to bless other people. And you never make a a request of God. And you need to go ahead and understand it's okay to ask. God invites you to ask. There are some of you that need to get over a bad theology of God. That God somehow is mean and nasty and doesn't like you. And so you better never, you know, make him mad by coming and asking for something. And there are some of you who right now are inside going, Woohoo! I'm going to make a list. If any of those are your kind of default way of thinking or things you've heard, then we need to understand the promise. Listen to this again, because this uh, has been abused and misunderstood and misrepresented uh, for as long as uh, I think the scriptures have existed. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Okay, that's the promise. So how does this promise work in our lives? Because we, we know it isn't quite that simple because we've probably all asked for something and didn't get it. Any, anyone else have a, have a time when you asked for something and God said no? Didn't, you didn't get it? Didn't come to pass? Okay, thank you. <laughs> all those of you that didn't raise your hands, I really want to know how you've gotten everything you've asked for. That just amazes me. You guys, I, I, I just didn't understand that. See, it's not this simple. It, we know that, that when we come to God with our requests, it is not like being on a cruise ship and having dinner. Okay? How many of you have ever been on a cruise ship? Okay. Yeah, lots of us. That's why I have weight issues, right? You're sitting down to dinner on a cruise ship. They come and take your order. And this is awesome because you can ask for whatever you want and they will give it to you. I mean, this is incredible, but we were just on a cruise recently for my celebrating 35th anniversary, my wife and I and some friends, and I had one friend that, kid you not, one evening ordered eight appetizers. Eight appetizers. Another night, he ordered five entrees. And the fact that he's sitting in this room, I'm not going to call it his name. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, I mean, it just, and they would just bring them. They wouldn't even bat an eye. They're like, okay, that's what you want. Uh, now, I confess, I didn't do five entrees or eight appetizers. I just leaned into dessert a lot heavier. So uh, we, all, we all have our vices. But that's, that's not how it works. That's not what Jesus is saying. 
He's not a waiter just taking your order to get you what you want. And then some, let's just be honest, we read this and, and, and we think, well, it works for other people, but it doesn't work for me because I don't have enough faith. There, there are some of our sister churches that pretty much say that God will give you whatever you want if you have enough faith. And, and that's poor teaching because that also is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, hey, if you don't get what you want, it's on you. It's your fault, and, and, and you're broken, and you're defective, and you just need to, to pray more and read your Bible more and believe more. Um, that's not what Jesus is saying. So how do we understand this promise? God invites us to ask, to seek, and to knock. Because when we ask God, we begin a conversation with God. When we ask Him, it, it, it starts a conversation with Him. It, again, it, the prayer isn't about saying the right words and you know, doing some kind of magic incantation and getting what you want. It, it is a relational thing where you're coming into the presence of God Almighty and you're making a request. And if you make a request, you're having a conversation. And that means it's a two-way discussion. So maybe you pray something like this, God, I need or I want a million dollars. Pretty sure I'm not the only one who's ever prayed that or whatever number you've prayed for, I don't know. And then God can respond, really? Why do you need it? Why do you need it? Well, because I want to buy stuff and indulge myself. Right, God? I mean, come on. You said ask and I can have it, right? So I want it so I can, you know, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a bunch to the church. I can't tell you how many people have told me, if I win the lottery, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build the building. And I go, and what else? Because if you win the lottery, you've got a lot more money than that. See, we, we promise, oh, I'll do all this kind of stuff. Well, I want to buy stuff. I want to indulge. I want to take care of my family. And God responds, uh, haven't I been providing for you? Don't, don't you have enough? And then we say back, but God, I want to quit my job and I want to play video games or, or travel or just golf all the time. And God can respond, but I made you for a purpose. And that's where you'll find your joy. That's where you'll find your meaning in life. That's, that's where you'll find satisfaction and contentment. You see, when we ask God, it begins a conversation. And, and if we continue the conversation, then God will change our minds and our hearts and our desires and our requests will become different because if we talk with God enough, eventually we will understand God better and we will start wanting what God wants. And we'll start asking for the things that align with God's purpose and God's will. If we talk with God enough, we'll want what He wants. And God will give us what we ask, and we will seek when we find, or find when we seek, and doors will be open to us that we never even dreamed possible. But it begins if we dare to ask, and, and understand this, if we ask, and it's not some kind of magic formula or where we get whatever we want, then we have to discuss the problem. The problem. The problem is we ask and God says, no sometimes. We already established that. We already said, how many of you did God say no to? And a lot of you raised your hands, and a lot of you didn't. Either you didn't ask or, or um, just are still waiting. <laughs> you still have hope. <laughs> God's going to give me what I want. Yeah, we see, there's a problem. And, and the Apostle James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, by the way, uh, wrote this in, in James chapter 4. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. On yourself. On what you want. So there's two reasons that James tells us why God says no. The first one is pride. You don't have because you don't ask. Look, all of us, all of us struggle with pride at some point. And sometimes we think, I don't need help from anybody, even God. I can do this on my own, and I'm going to be take care of myself, and I'm going to be the one who, who looks after myself, and I've got this. I'm not going to ask God for anything. By the way, 
doesn't work if you're a follower of Jesus because if you're a follower of Jesus, you've already asked God to forgive you and to save you because you couldn't do that yourself. That's why pride gets in the way of a lot of people following Jesus because they're like, no, nope, I'm not going to rely on him. I've got to do it myself. And if you're relying on yourself, then you're going to go to hell. And if you rely on yourself, you're not going to ask God. So James says you don't have because you don't ask. The other problem is greed. <laughs> we ask with wrong motives that we can spend it on our pleasures. I want to spend it on me. I want to indulge myself. I want to take care of my wants and my wishes and my needs. Yeah, I'll bless some other people along the way, but really it's about me. Can I just tell you that God is never going to indulge your selfishness? He just isn't going to do it because it's not going to bless you and, and, and God's not going to bless your selfish desires. And, and we know this because we read this whole passage together and we know this because of the parenting principle. See, the promise is in verse seven and eight, 7 and 8, but the, the principle of how God uh, interprets this or unfolds this is found in 9 through 11. Listen to Jesus again. Which one of you... If his son asks him for bread, we'll give him a stone. Any of you real jerk dads out there that your, your kid's hungry and he's like, can I have a piece of bread and you give him a rock? Anybody ever done that? I'm hungry. Here, have a rock. Chew on it. No, you don't do that. Everybody's like, no, we wouldn't do that. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. I know it says serpent in this translation. Snake. That's evil, isn't it? I mean, hey, can I have some fish to eat? Yeah, here's, here's, here's a snake. It's a play on words in the original language. We just look at it and go, ooh. And then Jesus says, if you then, who, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? See, God teaches us how he relates to us through the example of parents. I, I want you to understand, we understand how we relate to God because God is telling us, hey, I relate to you in the same way that you as parents relate to kids. So how many of you in this room are parents? Okay, most of the hands go up. Some of you are not yet, so you can listen in. So how many of you parents love your children and your grandchildren? Okay, I think everybody who raised their hand saying they were parents <laughs> raised their hand saying they love their kids. Didn't ask you if you liked them, said you, how many of you love them? How many of you enjoy blessing your kids and your grandkids? Yeah, we do, don't we? How many of you are sinners? Yeah. So that, that's what Jesus called evil. He said, if you're evil, you're sinners, you're people who have naturally rebelled against God, you break the law, you're lawbreakers. Uh, if you who are evil know how to do good things for your kids, know how to love your kids, know how to bless your kids, how much better is God than that? How much better is God than that? Because he's perfect, he's holy, he's righteous, he's good. In our imperfection and weakness, we still desire to bless our kids, yet God is perfect, he's good, and he's our Father. We're no longer slaves to fear. Why? Because we're a child of God. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then God is your Father. And as your Father, God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. He's not angry at you. He doesn't want to condemn you. He, he's, you know, he's not watching you, hoping that you're going to fail or rebel so he can just zap you. He's God. If he wants to zap you, he doesn't need a reason. Okay, he's already got a reason. We're, we're already, we're, look, as sinners, we all deserve hell. But because of grace, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, because he loved us and, and gave himself up for us, we've been adopted as sons and daughters of God. We get life. God wants to bless us. He wants to see us succeed. He wants to help us. He, he wants to, you know, absolutely pour out the, the best on life for us. So he wants you to be successful. He wants to fill you with love and joy and peace and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. I know that because it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in you. God wants to fill your life with those things. That's, that's what he's trying to do. That's how he's trying to lead you and bless you. So God wants to bless you. Do you believe this? Okay, not rhetorical this time. God wants to bless you. Do you believe this? Okay, now see, it's really easy to say that. 
but I'm going I'm to test it right here and right now. Then if you believe that God wants to bless you, then I also want you to believe that God knows how to bless you better than you do. God knows how to bless you better than you know how to bless you. And the struggle is this. We think we know better than God. Every one of us in this room has enough pride in our souls that we think we know better how God should bless us than God himself knows. In the same way that every one of us as teenagers thought we knew better how to bless us than our parents did. Right? Any teenagers in the room want to say amen to that one? They're like, <laughs> see? Still true. And why are we surprised as parents when our kids think exactly the same way that we did when we were their age? And so we, we think we know better than God, so we ask for the wrong stuff and for all the wrong reasons. I mean, we tell ourselves it's for the right reasons. I want to win the lottery so I can take care of my family and my church and I can do all this kind of stuff. God, just go ahead and do it to, give it to me and, I, you know, I'm not going to, like, let it ruin my life. And God's like, yeah, right. Yeah, right. And maybe that's partially true. Maybe you really are able to handle an incredibly large sum of money and, and it wouldn't ruin your faith and it wouldn't ruin your life. Uh, but what about your kids? What would it do to your kids? What about your grandkids? What would it do to them? You, can, can you say for certain that it wouldn't destroy their faith or their work ethic or, or, or that they'd end up, you know, just like forgetting about purpose? Are you sure that it wouldn't have a negative effect down the road? down the line. No, you're not. And so God says no, and what do we do? A lot of times we throw temper tantrums, right? I know. Those of us who are mature when God says no to what we really want, what we're really pouring our hearts out for, what do we do? We just kind of pout quietly, right? Hang our head. God said no. All right. He knows better than I do. I'll trust him. But we're not happy about it, are we? But some of us, sometimes, all of us, right, when God says no, we just flat out throw a temper tantrum. How many of you have ever had one of your children, when they were little, melt down in a public place? We're talking about full-on temper tantrum, kicking, screaming, crying on the floor. Yeah. Some of the young parents are like, today. <laughs> it happened today. Well, you know, it's very fresh. I've got, you know, some issues with that. See, how many of you, and, and, and this is, uh, we'll, we'll do the confession on the positive side. How many of you, when your kids do the temper tantrum, did not cave and give them what they wanted? Good job, parents. Good job. I remember watching uh, one of our girls in the grocery store start to do that and went, don't care, we're going shopping. <laughs> Pushed the cart away. Ended really quick. Really quick. It just, it, just, it happens. Can, can I just tell you that, you know, as if a parenting counsel, don't cave in that moment of temper tantrum because that's not going to bless the child or you. And when we throw a temper tantrum because God doesn't give us what we want, what we ask for, what we think is going to bless us because, you know, he knows better how to bless us than we do, that, that's not going to really win God over in that moment. That's not going to convince him that suddenly he should, you know, relent and give you what you want or think you want. And so what do we do? God says no, we rebel, we defy, we pursue what we think is going to bless us. Okay, God's not going to give it to me. I'm going to get it myself. And then we discover that it leads to destruction and we wonder why our life is a mess. You know, a lot of you are here tonight because God redeemed your life when it was a mess. And some of you are here tonight because you want God to redeem your life from being a mess. And he will, if you'll trust him. If you'll trust him that he knows better how to bless you than you know, or than you think you know. And see, this is an invitation from Jesus to trust him to bless you. Let me say that again. Jesus is inviting us, his followers, to trust him to bless us, to lead us, 
to seek his ways, to go through the doors that he opens, to ask for the blessings that he wants to give us because he knows better how to give. And this is a faith battle that will turn your life upside down if you learn how to trust God at that point of asking and taking his answer and understanding that his answer is better than your answer. To not only believe in God, but to believe that God's ways are better than your ways. That God's blessings are superior in every way to our desires. So do you believe this? That God really knows how to bless you better than you know? See, that's where it gets tough. It's easy to say we do. It's easy to think we do. It's difficult to live it. Um, in fact, I was thinking about this, and, and I thought, how do I put this into perspective that's from a child's viewpoint so that we can get it? Um, here's what it might look like from a child's perspective. Remembering that God is our Father, and we are the children in the relationship with God. God's our Father, we're the kids, and, and so let's put this in a, in a child's perspective. This is what it's like, I think, from God's perspective. Let's just say that uh, as a parent, you take your kids to that standby great pizza place, right? Chuck E. Cheese. Anybody ever been to Chuck E. Cheese or some wanting Im imitation? Yeah. Chuck E. Cheese, that, uh, that golden palace of mediocre pizza. <laughs> With, you know, German-fested play, you know, land and a money pit video arcade that just might as well just, you know, suck your wallet dry as you walk in. Right? Because kids are terrible at playing video games. They just need more money all the time. Right? Chuck E. Cheese. But if you're a little kid, Chuck E. Cheese is amazing. Right? I mean, kids love Chuck E. Cheese. I want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Chuck E. Cheese is awesome. Let's go. Ch Chuck E. Cheese is fun. And, and if you take your kid to Chuck E. Cheese, they're like, Every, where do you want to go? Chuck E. Cheese. Oh, rats. Okay. I ask you, so we got to go. Chuck E. Cheese. They want to go Chuck E. Cheese. And you decide as a parent, hey, it, it's time to upgrade from Chuck E. Cheese. Let's take a trip to Disneyland. Yeah, so you guys are like going, yeah, now we like, we like that. But here's the thing, your child's never seen Disneyland. Your child doesn't even know what Disneyland is. And, and, and uh, so you can say, hey, we're, gonna, we're not going to go to Chuck E. Cheese. I want to go to Chuck E. Cheese. No, we're going to go someplace better. There's no place better than Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> right? Because they don't know. I mean, they're young. And young and stupid goes together. <laughs> Old and stupid is just pathetic. So... Uh, <laughs> Kind of what Proverbs teaches. So, and so you, we go, no, we're not going to go to Chuck E. Cheese. We're going to go to Disneyland. And the child throws a fit. They just have a, a cry fit, temper tantrum, all the way five hours driving over to Anaheim, right? But you're persistent because you know. You're their parent. You know better. And you get to Disneyland. And suddenly the child sees the wonder of the Magic Kingdom, right? And Chuck E. Cheese is a distant memory. Now you've upped the perspective, you've changed the perspective, and now they understand you know better when it comes to entertainment than they do. See, we're God's children. And some of us think Chuck E. Cheese is awesome. Actually, some of us think McDonald's or the Playland is awesome. A few of us think Circle K with their two hot dogs for 99 cents is incredible. <laughs> and we're living there. We're camped out there. And God wants to lead us to Disneyland, and we're resisting. We're saying, no, I know better than you, God. I don't want to go. I don't want to follow. I don't want to listen to what you have to say. We want to do it our way. But see, he's not going to force you to go. He loves you. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to believe in him. He wants you to follow him. But he's not going to throw you in the car regardless of your screaming and drag you there. And some of us are spiritually stuck at Chuck E. Cheese. Because we're just not trusting God to bless us. You're not trusting God to bless you so you won't follow Jesus to life and, and, and the thing is, God wants to give us so much more. He has better blessings in store for us than we could ever ask for or imagine. And the only way we get there is if we trust him and we embrace his plan 
over our desires. And Jesus taught us to pray. We looked at this last week. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we say those words, but it's not about the words. It's about submitting our dreams and our desires and our wants and saying, God, I give them to you and and I want you to change my desires. I want you to change my wants because your plans are better than my plans. Your blessings are better than my desires. And, and, and then it's amazing because you'll seek God's will and you'll find it and he'll open doors that you never imagined and you'll walk through those into his blessings if you trust Jesus to bless you. Because God knows how to bless better than you do. So today are you going to ask God for his blessings instead of your desires? It's a conversation he wants to have with you. Because ultimately, Jesus wants you to teach you to pray like he prayed in the garden. Right? Because he asked, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But he didn't stop there. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's the prayer. That leads us to victory. But you got to have the relationship. And you got to have the conversation. To get to that place. Let's pray. Father your grace is amazing. Your love for us is absolutely incredible. That you are patient with us. Beyond compare. And you're inviting us to follow you into a blessing, uh, into a kingdom that is far better than anything that Walt ever imagined. And yet, we just confess, we struggle to trust you. We struggle to take your word and apply it to our lives. And so, God, I pray that that right now your spirit would move in this room and you would show us where we're resisting your will, where we're resisting your blessings, where we're resisting your leadership. And we would repent, and we would surrender, and we would follow you to life. You're the only one who can give us life. You're the only one who can bless us the way you want. And God, um, we want to be your children. We don't want to live as slaves to fear anymore. We want to live as sons and daughters of God. Teach us how to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.